Everybody. Let's start our webinar, the Strategic Analysis Cycle Handbook. Me, that's Erwin Kaley. I happen to be the director of the Institute for Competitive Intelligence. And it's my pleasure to greet our guest of the day, Eric Elgismar. Eric, are you in the session? No, I would like to hear something. Yes. Okay, maybe it takes some time until he will join us, so I can start already with a quick introduction, and then I hope Eric, Eric's microphone will be unmuted. Maybe that's a problem here. Now he's in the session, right? So Eric, can you hear me? I can hear you perfectly all right. Okay, so thank you. I had a little shock when you didn't respond immediately, but now I think you're really on board. <laughs> yeah, welcome to our session. Uh, the Institute for Competitive Intelligence, as the name already indicates, it's all about education in the field of competitive slash market intelligence. A vocational postgraduate training that we provide a whole range of uh, workshops and yes, indeed a conference as well. But of course, we're always interested in finding the latest, hottest topics in the market and we're always interested in meeting practitioners experts in the field who have a special topic or a special methodology on hand. And this is actually how I met Eric um, last year actually in, uh, in uh, the Netherlands at a conference and immediately I realized he has something to talk about. Yes, and this is pretty much our topic of the day, the strategic analysis cycle handbook. As we will hear in a moment, Eric is an author. Wow, can't believe it, he's a practitioner full in, and still he found some time to write up a handbook and indeed a accompanying tool book for this interesting topic, strategic analysis cycle. So I guess everybody is really interested in learning a bit more about hmm, Eric, and then of course his company, and then we go straight into this idea of having a well, a script like that ready to go for practitioners as well as with some academic, of course, intent. So Eric, would you like to introduce yourself? I understand you have a slide for that. Yeah. This is uh, a lot of text on a, on, a, on a slide, so I'll just talk you through briefly. I'm with Friesland Campina, which is an international dairy company some of you may have heard about. Currently I'm working in one of the business groups of this particular company in cheese, butter and milk powder. We realize an annual sales of about 3 billion euro and I had the strategic analysis section within this business. I've spent most of my career in strategy positions, hold uh, a PhD in engineering, did some post, um, say, doctoral uh, education in different business schools, if only to get a flavor of the, uh, say, the world of business, not only in practice, but also a little bit in theory and have had a, basically in my career the opportunity to work some over 30,000 hours in strategic pro uh, analysis projects, usually in support of business plan making, in support of M&A, uh, in support of large uh, capital expenditure projects, working in different industries, both in business to business and in food, say fast moving consumer channels, as well as in food, chemicals, a little bit in uh, the mining industry. So I had a little bit of a broader scope in um, terms of channels, industries, and, um, and geo. And I decided to take the time to, um, to write down some of these experiences for others to benefit from. OK, that sounds really interesting. So let me jump in here as today we have a bit of an interview session, not so much of a uh, monologue, i.e. a presentation from Eric. When did you actually touch this topic of intelligence? This is now competitive or market intelligence, obviously. It's not really uh, given that it's, uh, it's some... Yeah, 30 uh, years uh, ago, uh, Rainer. Yes, please, go ahead. Yeah, I believe it started some 20 years ago when I moved from an R&D position in, in Axel Nobel to an, uh, say, uh, strategic analysis position. 
and then market intelligence became part of my responsibilities. So I, in those days, uh, that was not so long after the, say, Cold War had uh, sort of terminated, that there was a lot of interest in applying intelligence for business, which was in the mid-90s. So I was on the sort of the wave of competitive intelligence finding its way to business. Um, and I, I surfed on that wave and got fascinated, and the fascination never left me. Okay, that's a good good answer, I guess. You have one point in your CV that suggests military intelligence uh, in London. This is a school, or what did you do there? That that was uh, an executive education training. James offers these sort of trainings specifically also to uh, people in business. They're yeah. focusing uh, the the key audience is people in security and and uh, sometimes in defense. But these trainings are public domain. And this particular executive education training took a week and focused on open source intelligence methodologies as well as to a longer extent in analysis of data or as they call it intelligence analysis and the whole psychology behind intelligence analysis. The key focus was on um, open source intelligence which is much broader than simply searching the internet but definitely how to use the internet to find data was a key part of it. All right. Sounds very interesting. But now you happen to be in a well company that's not really into the kind of, I guess, defense or sort of where you would assume this is all related to intelligence. Let's talk a little bit about your company right now to have a better understanding of the environment where you're working mm -hmm. in these days. Yeah, this is, I've never worked in the defense world, it's just that the methodologies, uh, for instance, in analysis, are very common. And business can benefit from some of the insights that have been, say, accumulated in the world of defense and security. But there are very, very pronounced differences. And one is that uh, I actually prefer cheese to grenades or <laughs> bullets. So Fair enough. that's why I, um, I, I rather taste our own cheese. Which means that I'm working in a cheese and butter and milk powder company as part of a larger holding. We also produce uh, nutrition for small children, one of the larger dairy companies in the world. And uh, we have about 11 billion euro net sales, more than 20,000 staff worldwide. We realize about half of our sales outside Europe and I've been involved also with the businesses outside the European Union. So the, the focus is much broader than the EU. And as a, as a peculiarity, I would say we are much more a family company than a listed company because we're 100% cooperative owned by the farmers in the Netherlands, Belgium and Germany that as members supply their raw milk from their farms to us as a company and we process it and uh, find uh, a good market for them, right. for those liters of milk. And that can be up to uh, more than a million liters an hour. So. We're, we're actually uh, also in terms of volumes, we're a large company. Yeah, well, could you share some ideas about, well, let's jump right to the topic, right? Rivalry, aggressiveness, who is your competition in this market? And give us an idea because later on we we'll talk about methodologies and obviously we want to have an understanding of what your competitive model is all about. Yeah, as, as a rule, we never talk about individual or the companies to the, to the world to outsiders. So I will be a little bit oblique when it comes to, um, to mentioning names. But yes, we do see a few listed companies in the FMCG world that are operating in the same categories as we are. Uh, we deeply respect these companies. Usually they have slightly other strategies because in that case, shareholder value creation is dominant, whereas in our case, we have a mixed strategy of creating as much value, but focused on the long-term continuity of our, say, farmers' farms. So that's why our, say, vision is uh, one of, not, uh, say, a quarter, but a generation. So we have a very much long-term view, which differentiates us in terms of choices and in terms of operation operational thinking um, from the listed companies with whom we compete. There are a couple of other dairy cooperatives with a similar size uh, that in some cases we also find as our competition in product market combinations and there's a very long tail of um, many local companies some being say smaller between 50 and 100 million euro sales some 
between say around 500 million euro sales and there's, there's such a diversity in food in the world and if there's diversity in food there's diversity in the companies that produce them so it's easy for us to mention uh, when we look at the broad range of product market combinations that we serve and that we sell it's easy for us to mention at least 300 different companies that we uh, say find as our direct competitors competing for the orders we would like to um, to deliver to our customers yeah that's pretty nice awesome and interesting overview of your market but again i'm sort of not letting you off the hook here is it very aggressive in terms of rivalry this industry especially you know, if you could compare it a bit to the Axon bell chemicals where you've been before just give us a bit of a sort of trend without of course well the, if, if i recall the intensity of competition when i was in Axon bell we in some cases um say three companies of which Axon bell was one together uh, had 95 percent of the world market in uh, a particular catalyst and that uh, still meant a three is a crowd. So the profit generation potential of that particular line of industry was not determined by the degree of consolidation. In our industry, I guess the same is true. We have product market combinations where we see multiple players, and yet because we have a superior product, we, um, we, we basically can uh, win market share and do so profitably and, and maintain or grow our profitability whilst serving our customers better and in, creating, in doing so creating a larger market share. So those bits and pieces are within our industry, whereas there are bits and pieces within our industry that are highly contested because there's limited differentiation between products from the one and the other company and by implication there's pretty tough competition, which means that things like supply chain efficiency rather than product differentiation matters. So right. we, we, we compete across many different product market combinations and actually um, all these individual product market combinations tend to have their own dynamics. Right, which already indicates what your day-to-day -day work must be like, let alone strategy in this field. So. Mm -hmm. I understand now, you took really this long, tough burden of setting up handbooks, plural, two of them. I think this is pretty much the next slide that you prepared. Mm -hmm. And for the rest of the session, of course, I'd like to learn more about these books, these manuals. And for the audience in our session, uh, feel free to send some chat posts. There's a little window on your screen, obviously, where you can ask questions to Eric he won't see them or I will read them out loud so everybody of course can uh, understand what the questions are and then of course Eric will try to answer while we talk while we chat some of these or all of these questions hopefully so how come this is of course my main question how come that a practitioner like you with a background like you in an industry like that writes books come on what's the problem okay. here <laughs> I, I believe, Rainer, there's two answers at the same time. The one is uh, a very simple answer. I live almost next door to the office, so I don't waste time commuting, which gives me more time to think. And so that definitely has been part of the answer. But the most important answer sounds perhaps a bit selfish. It's not meant to be. The, the books have, for me, writing these two books have been uh, a voyage of discovery, really. It enabled me to understand what I was doing by trying to explain it to somebody else. And when I, while explaining it to somebody else, uh, I thought, well, why not explain it to anyone that was, wishes to read about it? So I, I decided to, uh, to write it down in books. It, the very, very origin of what is what are today these two books happened to be uh, a one and a half hour presentation taking management teams through the intricacies of market intelligence as a starting point for setting up the market intelligence uh, plan for a year in that particular, say, as we call it, operating company or line of business. And then gradually from this initial, uh, say, 20, 40, 60 PowerPoint slide, deck, uh, I decided to add a bit more meat to the bone, write it out a bit more clearly, 
And then I found out that basically it shouldn't fit in one book because there were definitely two different approaches. On the left-hand side on the slide, you see a handbook, right. which focuses on the market intelligence cycle as it's depicted in the middle of the slide. So it starts with the management providing a brief for projects. You define the project. You make sure you collect the data from, say, the outside world and from those files that you've already, say, built up in the course of your job um, earlier. You move on to collecting the information. You report your work and you give a debrief to that management. And usually that debrief results in the next brief and the cycle is complete. In the handbook, um, basically, I try to, to guide the reader through every element of the cycle. But the focus, to be honest, is on analysis, where um, I see that the problems of getting things right uh, are concentrated. There is so much information out there in collection that in collection, when you have your open source intelligence right, as I just got, just discussed it uh, in the training provided uh, that I enjoyed in uh, in James, there is there's so much out there that usually getting the facts is not the issue. Public domain will do for most of your information needs, and if it doesn't do, then ethics comes in, so it has to do. So collection usually is not the issue, but analysis is, because analysis tends, you, you tend to have so many mental barriers to making good analysis. And the more I thought about it, the more I was intrigued by how we as humans are wired for jumping to conclusions, whereas usually in our line of business of, of trying to keep your head cool and coming up with, with uh, solutions to a puzzle, Jumping to conclusions is not the right way forward. So how can we avoid to get to be victim of our own mental biases, of our own say, mental wiring in, um, in the way we, uh, we think, uh, and then end up with the wrong conclusions? So there's, there's a lot of time spent on data quality in terms of, of uh, say, so the data science aspects of data quality of an individual data point. How can you trust it? What questions should you ask yourself about your source? Then I move on to um, when you have a set of data, how do you prevent yourself to take the wrong, draw the wrong conclusions? When you've got five or six different puzzle pieces, you reject the, the one with the highest accuracy if only because the one with the lowest accuracy was presented to you most vividly. So there's so much bias still possible when you have gone through your individual data quality assessment, when you've got a data set. Subsequently, you've got a data set. How do you then make sure that that data set um, does not lead to flawed, flawed conclusions, even when the data are properly weighed in terms of uh, quality? So there may also be risks in looking at the data set and then making, drawing the wrong conclusions. Uh, okay. Still, again, the, there's so many biases that can, uh, that can in affect, negatively affect your, uh, your conclusion. And then all, all the way up to uh, when, when you really believe you've got your analysis right, you get the, um, the challenge to not only have a proper analysis, but also get that analysis accepted because the impact of your work tends to be the product not only of quality, but also of acceptance. And that acceptance is by people that did not make the analysis themselves. They usually did not have the time to make that analysis themselves, but they are the ones that need to make the decision. So a new sort of psychology comes in. How do you as an analyst persuade, say, senior management to take decisions in the proper way uh, based on the fact that you have? So that's where reporting comes in. And then all the way you go to the debrief, Reiner. Yes, uh, immediately two, two sort of uh, questions comes to my mind before we go into some more depth now of really checking out the chapters and the kind of methodology that you provide. Mm -hmm. Does it mean that, back to your motivation of writing this book, does it mean that you recommend to, well, our participants in this webinar or to practitioners in general, that they should set up a kind of manual, an instruction guideline for their own teams, for their own companies, 
maybe not published as a book, right? But is it really something that you discovered some value? Uh, what, what, yeah, what I have discovered uh, in, in the practice in um, both in Action Nobel as well as here in, uh, in Friesland Campina is that it helps to standardize uh, the methodologies in market intelligence. Because when you, when you develop with among analysts, you develop a certain language, then that language as such starts to create its own value. Because then suddenly you start also, and it's not only in, among the say market analysis community within a company, but especially also in the interfacing with your, um, with your management, it helps when, when you can refer to a particular concept of, of an analytical approach like profit pool, as, as we will discuss in a minute in the toolbook, and that particular profit pool concept has a meaning. So when we in, in, a, in a business meeting talk about profit pools, we know we all understand the same concept. And I, I would recommend uh, anyone in this business uh, of, of being analyst and supporting an, uh, senior management in, in analysis, to try to develop a jargon where everybody buys into and that, that uh, makes your meetings more efficient and avoids getting the confusion in about what a particular, say, approach means and what it can and cannot do for your okay. quality of your decision making. Okay, then the second quick question, then we have our first uh, question from the chat um, bar. Uh, would you <laughs> sort of turn it around? Aren't there good books around that somebody could use already? Aren't there sort of undergraduate, postgraduate books for academics at university or even more practitioner-oriented manuals around in thousands that somebody could use? So where's the bits of sort of differentiation here or the need for writing these books? I know it's a bit provocative, Eric, but come on, give yeah. it to us. Um, the reason for writing these books and not building on existing books or, or using existing books is, is basically twofold. The first reason is that the book that I grew up with, so to speak, in the mid-90s, uh, Larry Kahana's book on competitive intelligence, I still recommend to everybody, but I have to admit, it starts to become a bit outdated when it comes to the examples when it comes to uh, the fact that in those days the tools were not very well developed, etc. So the book that I grew up with myself and that, that served me extraordinarily well is 20 years old. There have been some books in the meantime, but in the past, especially seven, eight years, it was basically as a result of my hobby in, in studying history as a, as a pastime that I discovered the world of, uh, in as far as it's in the public domain, of, of analysis in uh, in support of defense and security. And right. the analysis, anal intelligence analysis from that world, I have tried to sort of uh, use for inspiration in building better thinking about um, analysis for business. And I think that differentiates these two books, especially the handbook, from other books that are available in this topic at this moment, on this topic at this moment. Okay, in a moment we'll jump into a really chapter and pick some of these approaches and drill deeper, and then of course you can make this point again. But I'd like to sort of read out a first question from our audience, a little bit about the background, how you operate um, in your company. This mm -hmm. is, are all research projects defined by management? How to get the intelligence, innovation in the organization to provide input for potential project investments, options to Am I? So it's pretty much two questions, right? Yep. Uh, I'll try to answer them one by one. The first question is there's only one good uh, source for a project, and that's management, because if they don't feel there's a need for decisions, it's uh, also more difficult for them to accept that you have something that they need to know. So, however, on the other hand, uh, if they believe they have a particular information need or an analysis need, then that helps to define a project. So what we in this company try to do is, uh, at least now in the business group I'm working in, is on a, on a yearly basis have, have an inventory of the, the most relevant topics that need to be studied, and then subsequently prioritize based on the potential business impact and the assessment of the success we can have prioritize that into a project portfolio of, um, 
of analysis projects. And those analysis projects are then resourced partly by the business themselves, partly by, uh, say, a business group level staff department, partly when necessary outsourced to a trusted third party. And the total portfolio is then, say, moved forward in a year. Would that answer your question, Rainer? Uh, I think this is, again, this is a question from the audience, but I think it does. Yeah. And the second part war was how to get the intelligence innovation in the organization to provide input for potential project investments, options to MI. I think this is a question about impact. So you do a wonderful job yeah. in the intelligence, but uh, will it really change? When I think of innovation, I think investments. Yeah. And getting investments funded is always a challenge. And that starts with credibility. And credibility starts with having contributed to previous uh, decisions. And that contribution was positive, obviously. And by having built that credibility, the time you come forward with an investment proposal, you may find a more receptive audience. Because in, in the past, you already contributed to, say, uh, the, the bottom line of the business. And once that credibility is being built, you can also start to try to work on, on innovating your, say, market intelligence methodologies and even get some budget for training or get some budget for, for implementing a superior software tool, etc. Because they know that, that, first of all, as an analyst, you've proven your worth. And secondly, as an analyst, you're, you're close to uh, the best practices in the industry that are in your functional department that are available. And you need to be, uh, you need to stay on top because competition is moving as well. You're not, uh, that, I mean, you're not on a flat, uh, we're not running on a flat uh, road. We're running on a road that constantly goes up. So you have to keep on training to, to keep up your speed because the other competition will make sure your road will never be flat. Right. You always run uphill. Okay. But if you outrun them, they may lose their breath. And that's exactly what we aim for, of course. Yeah, no, this is a good carrot and stick approach, I guess. Okay, let's move into your book a bit now, drilling deeper. You yeah, so we, we have the handbook. In parallel, there's a separate, uh, shorter book. The handbook is, is approximately 200,000 words, so that's a bit more in depth. The tool book is 70,000 words, which is, which is briefer. And the tool book basically consists of um, four different main sets of tools. One is one are what I would call generic tools. Then there's tools that are focused on the competition. There's tools that are focused on understanding your markets that you're operating in. And there's specifically um, a brief outline on scenario analysis. When you look at the generic tools, you see, of course, that I, I, I wasn't awake when I made this slide because scenario analysis comes in twice. But well, will you apologize me for making that mistake? Well, come on. <laughs> There's pre-mortem analysis, which is um, which which means uh, that you really want to understand something by saying three years from now, say a large company around us has bought their neighbor company. How come that end game has emerged, and what could have happened for that end game to emerge? And what do we need to believe uh, for that end game? And what may be early warning signals? So instead of a post-mortem, something strange happened. And now we look how come it happened. We say, consider that something happened. What should happen for something to happen? So that's the pre-mortem. The structured analysis is what if. And, and these are tools that help you to think. Help you to think through what is the industry I'm operating in. And what could our consumers say change? How could our consumers change in terms of mindset? And what would that mean to the success of our current and future strategy? Now, brainstorm is obvious. The Fermi solution, probably most of you will know at least a little bit, which means you have a complex question. How can you break it down into sufficiently, say, small steps that each of the steps you dare to make an estimate rather than look at the total package? And then say, oh, it's too complex. Let's um, yeah, let's get intimidated by the problem rather than uh, enjoy the solution. So Fermi solution is definitely uh, a tool that we often use. Break down a large problem into small problems. Try to have methodologies for all the small problems, 
look at the range of probability of a positive outcome of all these small and usually the probability of failure both ways um, cancels out over the total and the total is remarkable, ac remarkably accurate when you can look in hindsight what the real world looks like when you know the answer. Now competitor focus, uh, we're talking of course on what can they do as well as on what team is, um, so what assets do they have, do they have, what factories do they have, what products can these factories produce, what do they tell about it, what are the functional properties of their products, but you're also talking on the management, what exactly is their team, what are they trying to, to aim for, what are the owners expecting of the management. You can obviously analyze the performance, that's what many analysts in the financial uh, say, uh, service industry do, so what are the results, what, drive, what, what drivers do we see that predict future results, etc. And uh, preferably you'd like to understand what exactly does a company want to achieve and what plans would they have and what have they already told about these plans because usually investments are reported about uh, three, three years before that actual capacity of that particular investment hits the market. Now, if you know three years in advance what a competitor approximately is planning to do, then it gives you some time to prepare and uh, adapt or improve your own strategic choices. When it comes to market focus, um, most companies operate internationally and they, you sometimes just need to understand, especially when you're in consumer goods, what exactly um, is the dynamics of a, of a country in terms of macroeconomics, in terms of demography, in terms of uh, political risk, uh, for instance, with respect to import barriers or, or change of uh, relevant product legislation, etc. Then you want to understand your consumers and your customers. That is at the interface of competitive intelligence and market research, but especially when it comes to major business to business customers, but also, for instance, large retail customers. Customer analysis is 100% uh, covered through the methodologies of competitive intelligence. Segment analysis, so if you're in the food business, are the peanuts doing a better job than the bananas in terms of profitability and why and why are these peanuts so popular and then subsequently you discover that actually the whole world is going nuts because uh, nuts seem to be the next food race and when nuts are the next food race, it's where you properly positioned with your product range to benefit from that particular food grace. Because when the herd moves, you'd better be right with it. And the consumers often act as herds. And if you're prepared for the herd to move, then you can disproportionately benefit. And if the herd leaves and it leaves without you, you're in a bad shape. And finally, the size of the price. Market sizing obviously is, is a key uh, methodology when it comes to strategic analysis. And one that is so important that in the book we uh, will we'll see five different parallel methodologies for market sizing, each tried and tested, and none of them is 100% correct, but the sum of all these outputs together may give you a sort of an idea of what sort of market size you can expect when you, um, when you have some basic data in place. Finally, uh, scenario analysis, which say normally has as a role to be input to strategic conversation, talking about say, what assumptions do you take uh, on possible futures, and then when you have the assumptions and you describe your possible futures, then the next question, of course, is now what are we going to do? And then when in all scenarios that you define, usually you define four, maybe six, usually an even number and preferably more than two, so four or six is a common number. When you've got these four future scenarios, the big question is, um, you answer the question, what are we going to do now? What moves would we take that serve as well, no matter what the future looks like? Because suddenly when you see these different futures, which tend to be the extremes of what you may expect, and in all particular cases, a particular move proves to be serving you well, that particular move should be executed without any delay. Whereas some scenarios may say uh, invite you to take some actions, whereas others may invite you to take other actions, but some moves may serve you well in any scenario. 
and the latter moves, of course, should be pursued immediately. Mm -hmm. Moves should be considered, for instance, through early early warning signals when you see which scenarios most likely to emerge when new data come in. So how to turn thinking into action? Of course, there's also an implementation side. How to get management buy-in for these sort of lines of thinking? How to avoid that everybody's talking scenarios, but everybody thinks scenario means something different? So there's there's the whole acceptance part as well. So this is in a nutshell what's covered in the tool. Right, and, and, and there are two questions already coming up, Eric. And again, the whole audience or participants of this webinar are encouraged now to. <laughs> shoot some questions over because now it's really Eric mm -hmm. who can sort of help and um, try even to defend, I guess, his methodology for a certain purpose. In the moment, we have four more slides coming up with some in-depth sort of explanation of four of these methodologies, approaches. So please send in your questions, but two I'd love to read out and uh, of course, for Eric, for you to answer. Number one, what is your preferred methodology to predict competitors future moves? Yeah, my preferred methodology um, depends a little bit on the uh, impact of uh, that particular, of the, of the competitor. If it's uh, a competitor that we only, say, superficially compete with, with a very tiny part of our business, I probably uh, fall back on pattern recognition saying, well, this is the typology of that particular competitor. This is the sort of business line we are in and the, the, the profit pool that is in that business. So uh, this is a most likely assessment and if uh, you always wonder whether diving in deeper uh, is justified by the size of the upside of the price. However, if you're considering a major move by a competitor, or if, you, if you're wondering about major moves of major competitors that compete along a line of uh, highly profitable product market combinations with you, my experience is you can uh, apply a war game, uh, as we call it, uh, very efficiently and, and very effectively. And, and the war game is what we'll uh, discuss in Amsterdam in more detail during the conference. But the war game methodology has been developed together with a specialist consultancy firm here in, in Holland, for, at least for us. And uh, the war game methodology, uh, in, in a nutshell, um, helps you to uh, think in the shoes of the competitor, thinking you have their resources, thinking you've got their management assignment, thinking you've got their budget letter, say, for the instructions for your next year's budget, trying to think through, no, trying to be them, having their budget letter, etc., and then trying to plan their next year. Just playing them. And then there may be a team playing their marketing department, a team playing their sales department, a team playing their operations department, but playing them, them, them. And then a few hours down the road, used by, you use the template of questions, Having played them, you really try to, to, to find the insights, what can they and what can they not do with the resources, their capabilities, their, uh, say, the, the, the things that the owners want the company to achieve. And doing so allows you to, to discover insights you would never find individually. Because you need to play with a team with different capabilities and the second interesting benefit of doing this is that suddenly the whole team with that, that was in play, usually it's a management team of a company and, and their direct reports, the whole team that's in play suddenly vividly has gone through the same experience of, of by playing the competitor as if they were all ha they had all been hired by that competitor, suddenly realizing what a competitor can do, but also what is not so easy for them to do. So that you discover while playing, you discover the weaknesses in your own strategic plans and in your own assets base, as well as the strengths. And then suddenly you realize that some strengths with a little bit more, say, uh, emphasis in terms of, of investments may almost be um, impossible to overcome for the competition. Whereas in other channels, your strengths may not be so strong. And either you choose to strengthen them or you accept that that is a weakness and that the profit pool in that channel for you may be uh, difficult to defend. 
Right. So, here's a question. A, 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 a war game can serve you very well, but it needs to have a sufficient size of the price to defend, otherwise your resource investment does not, say, justify the effort. And then and here's a question, not just to war game, but in general, because obviously when we're playing war game, it requires that you have a lot of information, a lot of intelligence available about this to be played out competitor. So here's a question, how do you proceed with an MI if data is non-existing, partial, or simply not reliable? Uh, that's a fair question. There's, there's two answers. First of all, I believe collection rarely is the barrier for, um, for strategic analysis. There is so much out there and um, there's, there's so many chamber of commerce filings and there's, there's few companies that defy reporting in all ways. So that there will always be ways to legally and 100% and ethically obtain that data to support your thinking. Secondly, when um, you can't find data on the competitor you're most interested in, you may at least be able to find in companies that are very similar. And then you can use the logic of, of say, other companies at least as a proxy for your competitor you're up against. Why? Because in many industries you have the phenomenon of strategic convergence that to be successful in a particular relatively mature industry, you have to live up to certain basic rules. Because otherwise, that those are the best practices and everybody tries to copy everybody's best practices, resulting in a relatively homogeneous, say, of how we do these things in this industry. And I would say these generic rules help you to, to even when the data on that particular uh, competitor are rare, still to get to play the game. Because you, you consider yourself to be a branded food producer, you know the brands, you know the people that are in the sales because your salespeople know with whom they compete. They know each other, they have coffee together, they share talks. Whether you like mm -hmm. it or not, I don't, but it happens. Okay, and I think here's a question somehow related even to that, again about data availability often, what to do with it. Uh, it's quite clear with the analysis, but what if it's about the human intelligence? Looks not bad to get the insider in compet competitor's ranks. How it corresponds to the CI ethics and where is this red line, thin red line? There's a, there's a very thick red line. And uh, I'm extraordinarily um, uh, empathetic when it comes to, so I want to put a lot of emphasis on ethics when it comes to collection and human, human intelligence is the most vulnerable part when it comes to ethics. So I'm very, very clear with anyone with whom I work within the company and also in, in say contacts with other companies, that the best way forward is to shy away from anything that when it reaches tomorrow's headlines in newspaper for whatever reason will embarrass you. There is never an excuse. So for instance, you have, uh, you want to understand how a particular competitor operates. So you set up a session, can we understand this competitor and what are they doing and how are they doing it? And you find out that you have an employee that used to be working for that competitor. Now, what greater source of information can you have? And the moment uh, I hear it, my first reaction is I want to talk to that individual and I want to make clear to that individual very, very clearly that no matter whether the person participates or not, is completely irrelevant for the person's future in the company. No coercion whatsoever. And if that person says for the very good reasons, I think it is embarrassing for me to share things because I don't think my previous company is helped when I do so. And I think I'm not um, ethically and, and professionally uh, operating correctly when I do so. Then that is a fact that needs to be respected and applauded. So I'm very, very sensitive to making wrong choices with humans. And I believe you can do extraordinarily good in competitive intelligence while playing 100% fair play. And then no matter what's in the, what people think about, for instance, can be anything I do can reach tomorrow's newspaper because we do nothing embarrassing ever. 
Well, I think this pretty much gives an idea to answer this question, but of course, now on the broader view, this is fast moving consumer goods, this is uh, consumer industries. I, as you know, the other industries, B2B or simply mm -hmm. different sort of other reaches of this globe, where you have a different ethical understanding. And of course, human intelligence might play a much bigger role over there than your specific environment and industry. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah but a fair answer to a tough question, I agree. So maybe we want to sort of pick some of these methodologies and go into some more depth there, but again, yeah, I I think looking at the talk, we, we don't have too much time. Maybe you give kind of a quick, quick overview of some of yeah. them and sort of I'll, provide I'll pick, out, uh, I'll pick out just, say, one that's quite common. So I pick out the profit pool analysis, which we already discussed. And then basically you say, why do you do it? You do it to uh, support business plan making you may uh, do it for, um, say, an assessment of an M&A transaction. And this particular example, you see an indicative uh, EBIT margin, which may be different from dairy farming, dairy retailing, and dairy processing. And the higher the EBIT margin, consider in this particular case that the volume of this um, business is the same, the higher the profit pool. So the profit pool is the total profit generated by all the participants in an industry in an in say within particular geographical boundaries for instance okay and, and here's a question to that somehow related to that uh, are the past companies financial results a good source of intelligence because i assume this profit pool analysis is somehow linking to this official financial reports Yes, that they are highly useful and they're often used. But you need, on top, you need, uh, say, market sizing, and it's the it's the product of say um, EBIT per unit times market sizing that gives you the EBIT margin indicator. And quite often, different companies report, uh, say, uh, businesses on a different aggregation level. So there may be, for instance, a proxy indicator where you've got a pure play company that exclusively makes a particular line of products and happens to be listed. So you have a relatively uh, solid, detailed financial statement. And that particular industry, and if you've got two or three companies that sort of compete with each other and for which, which are all more or less pure plays, that gives you an idea of a profit pool in a particular segment of industry. Whereas, uh, just as an example, if you if you look at full service airlines, most of them are listed. You see the profit pool tends to be modest, if not negative. Whereas in discount airlines, the profit pool is much better, and there's a very different business model. Both are airlines, but the one has a much much stronger profit pool than the other, and as a result, the discount airlines tend to have a much higher valuation than the full service airline. If you look at pharmaceutical companies. Profit pools for most of the blockbuster products, and therefore for the general industry, tends to be very high. Whereas in some commodity industries, profit pools tend to be relatively low. So it it helps to use financial statements to get an idea of the profit pool by industry. But similarly, the profit pool by geography may be very different. And for instance, in consumer goods, the profit pool in the uh, emerging markets, believe it or not tends to be much uh, stronger than the profit pool in the, for instance, US or even much more in the European market. Because in that case, it is the balancing act all the way from the raw material to the consumer, where is the power in the chain? And if the uh, emerging markets in consumer goods, the retail chain tends to be less developed and less consolidated than in the um, Western markets, so the US or Japan, so on the developed markets, US, Japan, uh, Europe. So the profit pool tends to be more with the manufacturer and less with the retailer, whereas the opposite is true for Europe, where it tends to be more with the retailer and less with the, um, with the manufacturer or simply over the entire value chain, less as a whole. So yes, we do use the financial statements of many different companies, but mm -hmm. as a business analysis, I would say lens through which we look at the totals as well. It's not just an individual financial statement that gives us the insight. 
And there's a hang um, add on question to that from the same uh, participant. How about the competitor's historical market performance? So, same question how do you use it or do you use it at all? I assume market performance is now about market shares, it's about dynamics, it's about, well, having the blockbusters on shelf. When it comes to um, understanding competition, I always, it may sound a bit silly to the participants, so I apologize in advance, but I always take the decision as a starting point of my thinking. What decision would we take? And when as a company we decide to go left or right, we need to decide whether we go left, invest, or right, not invest. Then the, how the competition, say, uh, determines whether we go left or right is the question to answer and how much detail do we need to have on this market performance, historic market performance of that particular competitor to decide whether we go left or right. And the more important the decision or the more, I would say, the stronger the track record of that particular competitor in playing hardball with us, the deeper we probably go, because the size of the price justifies the effort. And then, indeed, in some cases, we go 16 years back, if only to get a grip on the real underlying capabilities of that particular competitor that, that sort of uh, shares from the dollar. And then you, when, when you take not two or three years, but 16 years in, in an industry that is volatile, you see that competitor uh, go up and down a little bit in terms of, of, say, the industry cycles. But when you've seen have seen it gone through three or four cycles up and down, you you get an idea of the intrinsic res resilience, for instance, of that competitor. And for that, you need not one or two years back, but 16. Whereas in other cases, you only need the last three quarters because that's where um, let's say where that capabilities already are sufficiently clear from. Would that no. answer your question? I, I think it does. Yeah. Okay, let's move on. I have not much time left, so we can do about 60 minutes. Well, so with some yeah, seven minutes there's another, so this is a complex diagram I perfectly realize. Normally, say, companies are not um, robots. They are not run by algorithms, they are run by humans. And especially if you look at companies where you have a relatively centralized decision making led by a strong CEO that has relatively high authority vis-a-vis -vis the owners of the company, so has a relatively high degree of freedom when it comes to decisions, it may at times pay off before you do or not do a big deal that the other company may also want to do, for instance, in competing for a particular M&A transaction with another company, to really try to understand the other person's leadership style and leadership as a person. And there's, there's the elements of the company environment, the professional self of that leader, the psychological self of the leader, and the cultural environment where this particular individual operates in. And together, the whole picture, and sometimes you need an anthropologist to, to help you studying, say, culture at a distance, the whole setup may sort of help you predict what will the poker player at the other part of the table, when will the person bluff, and when will the person proceed even beyond rationalism. Because the rational part is easy, but the psychology is definitely not always rational. So if, if decisions are relatively... Um, strongly determined by individuals, then the chances of those decisions being always 100% rational diminish. And then sometimes you need, say, psychological help from, from people that have really understood how to do these things, like uh, anthropologists, to, to add to your, if only to the completeness of your assessment on what this particular company may do, because that company is a shadow of the leader of that company. And if you understand the leader, you may predict where the shadow is going. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Um, Eric, I think we have to move on to the final yeah. slides and allow some more questions. If some the we mean, we discussed. And we, the best way to, already, yes. is to play it out yourself. Yes, and then, of course, now uh, we have to sort of let them know, our audience, that you will be presenting at the uh, ICI's, our international conference in Amsterdam on May 11th. 
exactly about this war gaming as a hidden driver behind market victories. And yes, this uh, very books of you um, are not available yet, but they might be available in May. So if mm -hmm. you're interested just in the book and not in the conference, please even then show up because Eric will be there, obviously he's signing if available his books. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's just some, I guess, some drinks and some uh, snacks for you. But of course, it's a wonderful idea to sort of talk to the author and, and new mailer, by the way, will be around. Practitioners from the field talking about methodologies, discussing latest trends, and of course, seeing eye to eye what their experience is all about, right? And that's halfway through to becoming more uh, professional in this industry. Yeah, um, thank you very much. I think we're pretty much at the end of our 60 minutes uh, session already. Time's flying really by like nothing. So it was uh, very interesting and I've seen uh, many interesting questions coming up. So thank you all for attending. Uh, Eric Algesma, thank you very much. And of course, you're available as well for chats and for questions. After this uh, very session, he has a LinkedIn profile link. And of course, uh, they can always get in direct contact with him. And, and if any follow-up questions should come, of course, I'm sure Eric is willing to help you. Correct. Yeah, then uh, final slide from, from our session is, of course, from the RCI world again. Um, this webinar is many others from our series. We call it Inside Webinars. is available on our website, so check out Institute for Competitive Intelligence.com Insight Center or simply competitive minus intelligence.com. Yes, we run workshops, not only webinars. <laughs> so please have a look. There are some coming up in Paris and of course through the year will be in China, in India, in the US and of course um, Germany as well. So check out if you are interested in this kind of education and this kind of training for yourself. And yes, again, meet us. And this is now myself, Ryan Kelly, as well as Eric Elgism in Amsterdam, May 9th to 12th. That's where we all meet, and hopefully you'll be there as well. So thank you very much to everybody for attending, and enjoy your rest of the day or the whole day, wherever you live, wherever you work. Thank you.